Dr. Carl G. Stonecipher, an ophthalmic surgeon and medical director with TLC Eye Centers in Raleigh and Greensboro, North Carolina, has an extensive background as a lecturer, author, and FDA trial contributor in the fields of corneal, cataract, and refractive surgery. In this issue of the VJO, Dr. Stonecipher presents the data and conclusions of a study he conducted on the outcomes and complications of a group of his refractive lensectomy patients over a period spanning 1993 to 2000. Dr. Stonecipher begins by explaining his motivations for the study. Primarily, I was at Academy this year and, and I was with two of my retina colleagues and we were talking about the surge in refractive lensectomies and, and they both looked at me and said, you know, with, with refractive lensectomy, retinal detachment rates of 8 to 15 percent, I think that's going to be a real problem. And I looked both at them and I said, you know, I, I disagree respectfully that, that the retinal detachment rates are that high. And they said, well, how would you know? And I said, well, I've been doing refractive lensectomy since 1993 and, and I would like to look at that and prove that to you. So it, it was kind of a, um, you know, a discussion. Looking at the literature, I looked it up and between these two retina colleagues we decided well we want at least a five-year follow-up in these patients so we, we, did, we want them to be at least out five years so I chose from 1993 to 2000 uh, for that reason uh, and looked at both the myopic and the hyperopic population because you know everybody will say refractive lensectomy in the hyperopic population is probably a safer option I mean obviously there's risk of intra, uh, you know, intraocular infection and, and issues uh, there but for the most part uh, you don't have as many issues of retinal detachment uh, in the hyperopic population, the myopic population with the larger uh, axial links is going to be more of a, an issue with retinal detachment rates. So in this specific population, we looked at all uh, those three groups and basically felt that, you know, we're going to look at retinal detachments, but the other caveat that they brought up was cystoid macular edema. So I looked at those rates um, in comparison as well because I felt that those were the two main complications that you could see after this procedure and they agreed with that. So pretty much the patient population come, came from that series uh, from 1993 to 2000, and the refractive error ranged from minus 21 and a half all the way up to, to over 11 diopters of hyperopia. In 1993, you know, a lot of people look at that as a very early start to the re refractive lensectomy market, and it's true. Uh, but I felt that I didn't really have a good hyperopic option. So in these patients, what I was really doing was electing a procedure that I knew, cataract surgery, offering it to those higher hyperopic patients, and we only had a multi monofocal lens at this time period, so obviously you're, you're looking at distance vision or you're looking at a monovision type situation, but they were some of the happiest patients I, I had, and I thought that this would be a group to start with and, and go to 2000 so that we had uh, enough time, uh, and this was again looking with my retinal colleagues about what they felt would be a comfortable time uh, to report. Now the population total is 317 patients. Again, the surgery dated from 1993 to 2000. The range of spherical equivalent was from minus 21.5 up to 11.5 diopters. So these were all in the days before intraocular contact lenses were available and, and many of the other modalities that we now use today. Uh, the range of cylinder was as high as uh, six diopters and, and you know, other modalities were used to correct uh, the cylinder such as limbal relaxing incisions. The range of axial length was 20.28 to 29.7 millimeters, and the range of age was 26 to 80 years. Now, you say, well, an 80-year-old does have some level of nuclear sclerotic changes, but this patient was 20-20, was best corrective visual acuity, and was looking for an option. And then the range of the intraocular lens was from four diopters all the way up to 30 diopters. Now, remember in this day and age, a lot of the pa we didn't have access to lenses that went to the levels they do. So some of these patients receive piggyback intraocular lenses to create and correct their, their full refractive error. Now, in the series, best corrective visual acuity had to be at least 20-40 preoperatively. That was just my definition. And you've got to realize that amblyopia did exist in a number of the patients in this population because of their severe refractive error. But they didn't have cataracts, but some of them did have worse vision. And patients, you know, were excluded from the group. They had any preoperative systemic pathology, corneal pathology, and or any age-related macular you know, disease existed. So the literature supports about an 8 to 15 percent retinal detachment rate, but with modern phacal emulsification equipment and with clear corneal incisions, you know, I, I felt that this was a good procedure. And so that's what techniques were used 
uh, starting in 1993. And, and like I said, any retinal pathology in these patients, what I think was done different, were that I had them seen by my retina specialist. So they got an independent evaluation by one of two specialists in my practice, and then if they needed it, they were appropriately treated. I think that the implications are that we can better educate our patients and our retina colleagues about what the true retinal detachment rates are uh, with modern phacal emulsification techniques. I also believe that we can educate our refractive surgeons and our refractive cataract surgeons specifically that have a low threshold to refer these patients into a retinal practice that you trust and know. Um, a large majority of these patients uh, I saw uh, were referred to a retina specialist, and, and that was roughly around 45 to 5%. Of those patients that referred, 57% of them were treated in some format, and that was specifically mainly the, the myopic population. They were doing peripheral laser for small little holes or tears in the periphery, and then we would wait the appropriate time, which was usually six months after the laser before any surgical procedures were done, and that the retina colleague had said, you know, that's appropriate, and they can now undergo surgery. So in the refractive error, we have myopia accounting for 65%, uh, hyperopia is 33%, and two were emetropic. And the preoperative uncorrected visual acuity was in roughly the 2150 range, and the postoperative uncorrected visual acuity was hovering around 2030-ish, or a little bit better than 2030-ish postoperatively. Now, this is one of my favorite slides uh, to show that, yeah, these patients did get better, and we did see some of these amblyopic eyes gaining lines of vision. So looking at the preoperative best corrective visual acuity versus the postoperative best corrective visual acuity, uh, I would say that that was arguably related to the fact that many of the amblyopic patients actually gained lines of vision. Now, someone may argue that, that they really had a cataract or they had a small cataract and you were, you were just treating the cataract, but, but these patients I specifically looked at were not and, and, and were not in the cataractus population. Now, preoperative best corrective visual acuity versus postoperative uncorrected visual acuity is kind of our yardstick. It's, it's what the patients saw before surgery in their glasses or contact lenses versus what they saw postoperatively. The most exciting thing about this is twofold. To be included in the study, you had to have a level of vision that I classified as 2040 or better. And again, I talked to the retina colleagues and we kind of polled what kind of series that we wanted to look at. Um, because a large majority of these patients have a degree of amblyopia. So the patients may be 20, 30, you know, 20, 40, but not have any lens pathology. And in this group, none of them had lens pathology. And so that was the important point. So I, I looked at the healthy population of people um, and, and decided that we're going we're gonna to look at a certain level of visual acuity. Now, the most exciting point in that amblyopic population is a lot of those guys gained lines of vision. So they went from 20, 40, to 2030 or 2020, and somebody might argue that, oh, they had nuclear sclerotic changes, but I mean, these, this was even in the young individuals that were 26, 27 uh, years of age. So we saw an increase in their uncorrected and best corrected vision, and really the most exciting thing to this group was what they saw in their glasses or contact lenses was equal to or a little bit better uh, than what they saw uh, postoperatively uh, uncorrected. And, and, and you take somebody that's got you know, 11 diopters or more of refractive error, whether that's farsightedness or nearsightedness, and allow them to see it. They're pretty excited. It's a good group. Now, YAG lasers accounted for roughly about a third or a little more than a third of the patient population. And the literature supports a YAG laser rate of around 10% with modern surgical techniques and technology. Um, but literature at this time period that we're looking at specifically from 1993 to 2000 supports a rate of around 33%, which was, was pretty much the same. Now, the hyperopes showed much lower levels, and I'm not quite sure of the etiology for that other than, the, you know, the way in which the lens sit in the, in, the, in the posterior chamber. Specifically, one of the issues that we also need to discuss is what else could cause problems. Well, postoperatively, we saw higher you know, uh, incidence of YAG capsulotomies in the entire group of the myopic patients, uh, and that was roughly around uh, the mid-40% range. It was around 46%. And, and the hyperopic range was actually fairly low. It was lower than, than the overall group, which was at 36%. Now, the reason I worry about YAG capsulotomies is because, you know, two of the risks of YAG capsulotomies are retinal detachment, and cystoid macular edema. So I wanted to capture that. So then when I looked at the literature, 
I found that that, that was a pretty comparable rate, that, that about one out of three patients actually get a YAG capsulotomy from 1993 to 2000 in this group we're talking about um, in cataract surgery. But, but with, with modern techniques, modern intraocular lenses, the retinal detachment rates are more around the 10 to 12 percent level. So I didn't see an increase is where I'm going in any of the patients that had gotten a YAG capsulotomy. So I didn't see that a YAG capsulotomy produced cystoid macular edema. I didn't see that it produced a retinal detachment in anybody in this series. Are there any considerations with the age of the patient being a predisposition for detachment? Do we see a more of a problem in the older patient population versus this younger patient population? And that was the argument. The argument with this group was that the myopic younger patients are going to have a higher retinal detachment rate. And we didn't see that. In fact, we saw a very low rate of retinal detachment. Um, and, and again, the younger population aggressively healing uh, were more likely to develop CME, and, and we didn't see that as well, too. Now, we're aggressive with treatment. Uh, I used a steroid and antibiotic for two weeks postoperatively, four times a day. Um, I, I, you know, non-steroidal use was not uh, an issue during this time period, or circa around cataract surgery, but in my refractive lensectomies today, I do tend to add a, a non-steroidal in this patient population. So my summation slide uh, is I'd like to look at the bottom. 57% uh, of this patient population was referred to a retina specialist. I had a very low threshold to refer these patients. So if I saw any peripheral retinal abnormalities, and we're probably talking more about the myopic patient population than the hyperopic group, but if they had any kind of pathology, they were immediately referred. And of those that were referred, um, we had, you know, 57% of them treated. So we basically referred 4.5% of the patients to a retina specialist, but a large majority of those patients that were actually there actually received a laser of a retinal hole or retinal tear or retinal abnormality. And that accounted for about 2.6% of all the eyes. Now the two most important findings, and this was the original point of my study, was CME rates and retinal detachment rates. And, and really the CME rate was 0.6%, uh, and all those were treated without any uh, sequelae to their best corrective visual acuity. And, and we had 0.3% as a retinal detachment rate. So what I'm trying to point out with this study is that I think that patient can be adequately educated in a day and time of 2008 that the risk of retinal detachment is much less than what the literature is supporting. Now, one of the things that I looked at uh, with this group is I wanted to see how this group fared in relationship to my LASIK volume and I was looking basically at the, the, my practice trends, and my practice trends of the day was that my LASIK volume numbers, the people are getting younger, and more of the baby boomers and the older patient populations are now choosing refractive lensectomy because they have the option of a presbyopic treatment as well. So I, I think that, you know, we're talking about LASIK volume trends uh, we're down for 2007 slightly, and, and I think some of this may account to the fact that aging boomers have sig significantly affected this and that, that the myopic procedures are decreasing as they age out of this LASIK range, and, and the hyperopic procedures are increasing as the boomers' hyperopia manifests or their latent hyperopia manifests. And the Gen Xers and the Millennials are, are aging into this myopic LASIK population, and, and I think you're going to see more and more of this segment uh, coming into LASIK and I think you're going to see more and more of the older patient population, specifically the baby boomers, uh, trending towards a refractive lensectomy option. And, and I'm finding that more and more my hyperopic LASIK market is dwindling because I'm re referring more of those patients to the refractive lensectomy as an option in my, my baby boomer population, or my older patient population. And, and my marketing trends are, are geared towards the Gen Xers and the millennials or the younger uh, patient population. And I think, you know, this may be unique to me, but we've also looked at a large series of practice patterns with Dr. Kazarian and, and his data link uh, group, and we're, we're seeing similar findings across the United States. So I think it's important to track your demographics, look at your practice, see what's happening over the course of the years, and then you can compare your demographics to the community. And, and, and there are variations that exist, but I think for the most part, see if you're seeing the same trend. <laughs>